In this video, I'm going to lecture over chapter 10. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's start right into the PowerPoint presentation for chapter 10. Chapter 10 discusses accounting for liabilities. And it's a relatively long chapter, just like chapter 9 was. Chapter 9 was accounting for long-term assets. 10 is accounting for liabilities in general. So current liabilities, these are obligations the company has to satisfy in either goods, but usually, um, either goods or services, but usually satisfy in cash. And they have to be satisfied within a year. Technically, they have to be satisfied within a year or the normal operating cycle, um, whichever is longer. But usually a year is longer than the company's normal operating cycle. And so you can just remember this as within a year. Don't worry about that technicality. Current liabilities are obligations the company has to satisfy by either providing goods or services or cash to, um, to another party. Um, and they have to do that within a year. Examples of current liabilities, accounts payable. These are amounts that are due to, um, to short-term creditors. They're usually non-interest bearing company doesn't have to pay interest. Um, usually like a company will have a, take Walmart for example, they have many different suppliers. All the products on Walmart shelves, well not all of them, but the, the vast majority of them are not made by Walmart. They're made by some other entity, a supplier to Walmart. The supplier will supply the goods to Walmart and the supplier will allow Walmart a 30 day to 60 day period to pay the supplier. So the, the supplier is the creditor. Walmart owes the supplier for the goods. So Walmart has an account payable with their supplier. And they just have to pay the supplier the amount that they owe them within the um, period that the supplier states. And they don't have to pay interest. So that, that's, that's the typical account payable, just paying back your suppliers. Notes payable. These are slightly different. These usually are interest bearing. And this is where the company owes money to a bank, to, to a creditor who has lended them money. Walmart owes money to a supplier who hasn't lended them money, but has, has given them supplies, right? Some sort of goods. And so that's the amount they owe the supplier is called an account payable. But whenever a bank lends you money and you got to pay them back, it, that's called a note payable. Because usually you have to sign a formal agreement called a note. Um, and, and that formal agreement, that note, is the contract that dictates the how long you have until you have to pay back the bank. They're usually longer notes payable uh, than accounts payable. Um, for example, you could have three months to pay the bank back all the way up to a year if it's going to be a current liability. But there are many notes that are longer than a year and those would be long-term liabilities. So not all notes payable are current. Some are current, some are long-term, depending on the what the note says, what the contract says. So the, the uh, note would state how much you owe the bank, when you owe the bank that amount, and um, how much interest you owe the bank. And you usually with notes, you pay the amount that you owe the bank and the interest at the date when you pay them back. That's different than what we're gonna talk about coming up with a bond where you pay the amount that you originally borrowed, you pay that back at the very end, but periodically you make interest payments. Every six months that you make interest payments. And then at the very end, you pay the principal back to the lender. With a note, 
you don't make periodic interest payments. You pay the amount that the lender lended you, you pay that back to the lender after the 90 days are up or after the year is up, depending on what the notes say. And also on that date, you pay them all the interest that you owe them. Make this bigger. So here's an example with um, interest on a note. You have to make, you have to account for the fact so say the end of an accounting period happens and you there's an outstanding note you have with a bank. In other words, the bank has lended you money in the past and you haven't paid them back. Well, you owe them interest on that money. You're not going to pay them yet. You're not going to pay them until you pay back the principal, but you owe them interest. Uh, and that's another word that I haven't defined. The principal is essentially what the borrower borrowed from the lender. It's what the lender gave to the borrower. It's the dollar amount that you borrowed at the principal. So we contrast principal with interest. Pomona Corporation signed a 90-day note on November 1st for $10,000. So that's the principal. That's what they borrowed. The 6% annual, annual interest in exchange for equipment. So um, in this example, usually with notes, it doesn't, usually this isn't the way you, a lot of times you borrow money from the bank, you get cash and you owe them the cash back. In this case, um, Pomona has bought a piece of equipment by signing a promissory note. So they would debit equipment for 10,000, credit notes payable, they have a liability, 10,000. It's a current liability. They have to pay this, this uh, entity that gave them the equipment. They have to pay them back 90 days from November 1st. So just, just think three months. We, don't, we won't get into the, the day thing because that gets technical. You don't have to worry about that in this chapter. So uh, December 1st is one month. January 1st is two months. February 1st is three months. They owe them $10,000 on February 1st. Notice, though, that the accounting period, which usually ends December 31st, happens in the middle of this 90-day period. Not right in the middle, but it happens during the 90-day period. So we make this journal entry when we get the equipment. That makes sense. But we also have to make a journal entry on December 31st. This is two months into the note. We don't do anything on the 31st. We don't pay. We don't have to pay this. Um, this entity that gave us the equipment, we don't have to pay them interest and we don't have to give them the 10,000 back. We do that on February 1st, because that's 90 days after November 1st. But as of December 31st, we have to recognize that two months worth of interest expense has been incurred and we owe two months worth of interest payable. We haven't paid the interest yet but we have to recognize interest expense. So this is an example of um, an accrual where we recognize the expense first, we accrue the expense first and then the cash payment for the item comes later. This is an adjusting journal entry. If we go all the way back to the beginning what we were of the course when we talked about that in the first section of the course. So the key is, here is, I would hope that you know the debit and the credit account, but how to get the amount. So the interest is calculated as principal times rate. The rate is always given as an annual rate unless stated otherwise. So this didn't have to say annual. It could have just said 6% interest and you assume it's annual, it's an annual rate. Often it doesn't say the word annual. Interest rate given in all these problems and in the real world is always an assumed to be an annual rate unless stated otherwise. 
So 10,000, 6% would be the interest they owe on the 10,000 if they had a year to pay the 10,000 back. But since they don't have 12 months to pay the 10,000 back, um, then we have to multiply by what fraction of 12 months do they have till they have to pay the note back? Three over 12. So the three month interest rate is one fourth or three twelfths of the 6% because 6% is the 12 month interest rate. So this is the interest that they, um, that they have to pay for the three months. So 10,000 times 6% is uh, $600. And six hundred dollars times three twelfths or times one quarter is um one hundred and fifty dollars. Or fifty dollars each month. Since only two months has gone by. We have a hundred dollars, right? Two months. November first through to December first is one month, and then we have to December thirty first, that's two months. Or another way you could do this, instead of multiplying by the whole term of the note, multiply by the term of the note that's happened. As of December thirty first, two months, we work two months in. So ten thousand times six percent times two over twelve equals one hundred dollars. On January 31st, we pay back, or just, or February 1st, however you want to think about it, we pay back um, the amount that we owe the, these people. So we're going to owe them our 10000 that we originally borrowed, plus the $150 of interest for the three months. So we're going to owe them 10150 So we pay them 10150 and that's what we have to pay them. We... Um, Get rid of our note payable that we had established here because we no longer have that liability. We just paid it. It's buried in here. So debit notes payable. Um, debit interest payable because we just paid this interest. This is for the two months, November and December. And then recognize one more month of interest expense for the month of January that we haven't recognized. This hundred was just the interest expense for November and December. What about the interest expense for the month of January, right? One month has gone by from this date to this date. It's so one more month of interest expense. So we have to debit interest expense for 50 here. So here's the journal entry when we pay the note and the interest. Notice the debits, $10,150 equal credits, $10,150. Other examples of current liabilities are uh, payroll, payroll related liabilities. They include salaries and wages, amounts withheld from employees' paychecks by the employers, and payroll taxes and benefits paid by the employer. What amounts are withheld from employee paychecks by employers? Well, there's non-voluntary amounts. These amounts, employers have to withhold these, these things from employees' paychecks by federal law and state law. They have, to hold, they have to withhold federal income tax, state income tax. They have to withhold an amount for Social Security tax and an amount for Medicare tax. So four things that all, em all employers have to withhold from each of their employees, these four things. They have to withhold dollars for federal income tax, state income tax, social security tax, and Medicare tax. And what do they do with the amount that they withheld? Do they get to keep it for themselves? No, they have to turn around and write a check to the government for these things. They also withhold from employees' paychecks voluntary amounts 
So these things right here are things that the employee can opt out of. They can say, no, employer, you don't withhold these things for my paycheck. I'll take care of my own health insurance. I'll take care of my own retirement. These things up here are non-voluntary. The employee has no say over whether the employer can withhold these items from their paycheck. These items are automatically withheld. Most employees will opt in to these things as well though. They'll allow the employer to withhold amounts um, from their paycheck for health insurance, union dues, and retirement. And the reason is a lot of employers are relatively large companies and they have, they, they have, um, what's the word? They have, they're tied with um, health insurance providers, union, a union and retirement providers, and they can get their employees just dis huge discounts. If the employee um, allows, uh, goes, you know, gets the, the health, their health, the employee's health insurance, if it goes through the employer's sort of sponsor, then they're going to get a deal. For example, um, taking myself as an example, uh, every month, approximately $100 is withheld from my paycheck uh, for my health insurance. They take $100 from me for health insurance. And then my my employer, out of their own pocket, pays um, probably about $300 per month. So my health insurance cost $400 per month. That's what the health provider demands. That's what, that's the fee they charge. I pay 100 of it. My employer pays 300 of it. If I were to go and get my own health insurance on my own, I would have to pay all 400 of it. So by using the health and the healthcare provider that my employer has partnered with, in this case, it would be any hospital in this region, like UHS or these. Uh, using one of these folks for my as my health provider i get a huge discount instead of paying 400 dollars a month i only pay 100 they only withhold 100 so i allow them to withhold that 100 because i would rather pay 100 than 400. same thing with retirement i allow them to take out of my paycheck every uh month i get paid every two weeks but Every time I get paid, I allow them to take six percent of my check and withhold it. And by do and when I when they do that, they put in eight percent of my check, their own money. So fourteen percent of every check goes into my retirement account. Six percent from me, eight percent from my employer. If I were to go take care of my own retirement, I'd have to put and I wanted fourteen percent of my check to go in. I have to put all 14% of my, of my own money in. So again, I allow the employer to withhold for retirement. It's in my benefit. And the same thing for union dues. The point is these are um, non-voluntary and these are voluntary. What payroll taxes are paid by the employer? Well, it's these things here. So it's FICA and federal and state unemployment taxes. So um, employees don't pay these things. For each employee that an employer has, the employer by law has to pay a tax a FICA tax, a federal unemployment tax, and a state unemployment tax for each of the employees they have. What rate do they have to pay? And that, um, we'll talk about that in a second. Talk about the rate. There's a, there's a certain rate and that's determined through regulation of the rate they have to pay. And, it, and of course the rate is applied to the employee's salary. So the more the employee makes, the more the employer has to pay these taxes. And this is where um, 
our unemployment you know fund comes from you know when you apply say you're unemployed and you apply for unemployment you you, you know you apply for a check every month from the government because you're unemployed where does that money come from it comes from all these employers who have paid into that fund these unemployment taxes so employers are funding unemployment ironically and um, if they would just hire everyone that was unemployed they would no longer have to fund unemployment um, and then FICA stands for the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. It was an act packed, passed by con, um, Congress, and it's just an additional amount that's levied on employers. For each employee they have, they have to pay an additional amount, and that amount goes to another fund. We don't, you don't need to worry about what it is. But these are the two two other payroll taxes that the employer um, has to pay. So we, if you think about as an employee, your net pay is your gross pay minus all the amounts that are withheld from your paycheck, from your gross pay. Oops. So say you make, say your salary is $72,000 per year gross salary. You divide that by 12 and you get that each month your salary, gross salary is $6,000 a month right here. And then from that 6,000, there's going to be withholdings. I actually used to work as a uh, doing payroll at the University of Kentucky. For a large department on campus, we had 50 over 50 employees, a relatively large department. So I got to see on average given a person's salary, what percentage of that did they actually t take home? Did it actually was deposited into their checking account? And I could probably give you some rough numbers. If you make between 70 and 100, approximately, you don't have to remember these numbers, but I thought you might think that is interesting because I know something about this actually. Um, if you would take home probably between, um, I don't know, 64 to 66% of whatever your gross salary is in this range. Obviously, if you're making closer to the low end, you're taking home a higher percentage. If you make closer to the high end, you're taking home a lower, lower percentage. Of course, these percentages vary based on some states don't require state income tax, right? So your income taxes aren't going to be as much withheld. And stuff like that, but these are these are good rules of thumb. If you make between, I don't know, forty and seventy thousand, you're taking home between probably sixty-six. If you make seventy thousand to about, I don't know, close to seventy percent. If you make forty thousand, and if you get up over a hundred thousand, you're going to take home a smaller and smaller percentage. Um, if you make really high amount, you'll take home around 58 to 60 percent of what you make if you're making up over 200,000 a year. So these are some rules of thumb. If you ever get a job offer and they quote you a salary, you can quickly, using these rules of thumb, figure out what, how much of is going into your checking account every year. It won't be the gross. It'll be some percentage of that. And here are some good percentages. You can make these percentages go up by opting out of things like union dues, things that you have the option to opt out of. Don't tell them not to take that out. Tell them not to take health insurance and just go on and don't have health insurance. Obviously that would drive the net your net pay up, but of course it's bad to be uninsured for health insurance and so forth and retirement as well. It looked like this person took home 35, 16 of 6,000. So I don't know what percentage that is, but that was their percentage. You can see if that falls between in this range, because this is their gross pay for a year. Let's see, does it? 35, 16 divided by 6,000. Actually, it's um, a very, it's smaller, it's 58.6%. It's way outside that range. You might wonder if my ranges are right. 
Our ranges are pretty right, I think. These are some high amounts for union dues and health insurance. Um, maybe I should qualify this if you're single. It looks like this must be a um, married person with a family. Health insurance shouldn't be that high coming out of your check. Unless you've got a bunch of kids you're trying to insure as well and your spouse. Anyway, let's go into unearned revenue. Unearned revenue, great example, um, is uh, airlines selling airline tickets. So the way that works, uh, assume Southwest sells you a ticket on June 1st. That's when they sell you the ticket. And the flight is going to be is going to happen on July 15th. So on June 1st, if you've ever bought an airline ticket, they take the money right away. It's gone from your account. This is um, in contrast to the way hotels work. You might book a hotel room on June 1st um, for July 15th, and the hotel's not going to take the money from you until July 15th when you check in. But with airline tickets, they take the money right away. So what would Southwest do on June 1st? They would debit cash. They just got 300 cash from you. Cash goes up, debit cash, make it go up. It's an asset. And they have a liability to allow you to fly with them on July 15th. So they would credit a liability called unearned revenue. It's a liability, not a revenue. Then on July 15th, when you fly with them, they no longer have that liability. They just satisfied it. They let you fly with them. So they debit unearned revenue, get rid of the liability, and they credit revenue. This is an example of an adjusting journal entry. It's an example of a deferral. We defer the recognition of revenue until July 15th. Cash happens on July 1st, that's when we get the cash, but don't, we don't record the revenue until we earn it, until they fly with us, so we don't record the revenue until July 15th. So this is an example of a deferral adjusting journal entry. Same thing would happen with rent. If you're a landlord, debit cash, credit unearned rent revenue on June 1st. Then on June 30th, after the month has gone by and you've let them live there, you would debit unearned rent revenue, credit rent revenue. So you should recognize this. We've done this earlier in the course. Which of the following is not a current liability? So which of the following is not an obligation that the company has to repay or satisfy within a year? Accounts payable usually has to be satisfied within 30, 60 days. So that is a current liability. That, can, that can't be a correct answer to this question. Unearned revenue typically is has to be satisfied within a year. So that is a current liability. Payroll taxes payable. These are amounts that employers withhold from their employees' checks, and they have to turn around and give those amounts to the federal government within a year, usually. So that is a current liability. So by um, process of elimination, we haven't talked about bonds yet. Bonds typically are long-term. Bonds payable are amounts, are amounts that are borrowed that, that have to be repaid Within usually 10 years is, a, is an average time. 10-year bonds are pretty pretty common. 10 is greater than one year, so that's a long-term liability. How do we account for bonds? That's probably the hardest part of this whole course. Students have the most trouble with bonds. They're a little bit for some reason, they're a little bit hard to understand uh, the concept behind bonds. Um, so pay attention to this part in particular, and you can go back and rewind and watch the video over. I'll try to be as clear as possible. What is a bond? It's like a note. It's a it's a it's a contract, it's like a promissory piece of paper. Think of it. Here's a bond, and on that contract. The borrower offers a potential lender a promise. 
So we have the face value of the bond. Say $10,000 bonds are common. So we have lots of synonyms when we talk about bonds. And that's one of the that's one of the tripping points for most students because of all the synonyms. They get lost in the verbiage. What word means what? There's lots of synonyms. Face value of the bond is the same as the stated value of the bond, is the same as the principle of the bond. These are all words, different words for the same thing. Is the same as the amount borrowed, it's the amount that the borrowers. Um, it's not the same as the amount borrowed. It's the same as the amount that the borrower promises to pay the lender. It's the amount the borrower promises to give the lender, um, and so forth. Usually it's just called the face type. So it has a face value, then it has a maturity date. It has the current date. So current date could be, you know, April 17th, 2020, today. Maturity date, um, Actually, no, it doesn't have the current date. It has the date that it was printed, printed date. And bonds are not printed every single day. I mean, that would require lots of, lots of printing. Corporate bonds, corporations usually are the borrowers. They want to raise large amounts of money. The best way to do that is to borrow. You can either borrow, that's known as debt financing, or you can um, sell stock and get money that way. That's known as equity financing. Debt financing is usually done through bonds. So we have the printed date. They'll print new bonds, say, once every couple of years because corporate bonds, these, these covenants or these um, contracts, there's a, there's a market for them. And so there's a regulate. There's, the SEC regulates um, these things. So the company can't just print and offer these bonds to investors or potential lenders willy-nilly or behind the scenes. Each bond they print has to be inspected and say, okay, yes, you can do that. So the printed date, say, could be, you know, January 1st of 2018. They printed, you know, say 10,000 of these bonds, 10,000 of these Think this is one times 10,000. So if everybody bought a bond and all the 10,000 were bought up, that means the investors in total lended the company 10,000 times $10,000, a lot of money. Anyway, then we have the maturity date, which the maturity date is usually um, 10 years from the date that the lender gave the borrower money or the date that the lender invested. It's an investment from a lender standpoint. Why is it an investment? Because of the final thing, the interest rate. And the interest rate could say be, I don't know, 8%. Now, this interest rate is not known as stated interest rate, also known as the coupon rate. This is the rate of interest stated on the bond certificate. This right here is known as a bond certificate. Oh, I'm losing my... Um, Bond, I guess I can't write it there. This is this piece of paper is a bond certificate. You can think of it like that. All right. And so the borrower, the company, 
prints these bond certificates. The regulator says, yes, you can print those. That's fine. You can offer that. And then a lender sees this and says, okay, this company, say I see this on today, April 17th, uh, 2020. Hmm. This company, this borrower, potential borrower, if I give them the money, they're promising to pay me $10,000 back 10 years from today. So on April 17th, 2030, they will pay me $10,000 and they will pay me 8% interest. And it also has to state um, how often. Semi-annual. So these are the things stated on the bond, the face value, the maturity date, the date it was printed, um, the interest rate, and how often interest is paid. So if you bought this bond, you would lend the money to this company, and the promise is they're going to pay you $10,000 back on April 17th, 10 years from today, April 17th, 2030. And every six months, semi-annually, you're going to get 8% interest. I'm sorry, 8% is the stated interest rate. That's an annual rate. And interest compounds semi-annually, twice a year. So the six month interest rate would be 4%. Every six months, you're gonna get 4% interest. And the question is, well, how much are you going to lend this company for this promise? Are you going to lend them $10,000 for this promise? Are you going to lend them more than $10,000 for this promise? Or are you going to lend them less than $10,000? But all this bond is, is it's the promise. It's an investment opportunity. And you decide as a lender whether to buy it or not. What we're going to talk about in this chapter are the journal entries. How do we account for these bonds? Not as from the lender's standpoint, from the borrower's standpoint. From the borrower's standpoint, we have a liability. Um, if the lender lends money to us. We all of a sudden have this liability. We have to pay back the uh, face value of the bond at a certain date in the future. It's a long-term liability. And we also have to pay interest every six months. And that's a short-term liability because we have to pay it every six months. So there are different types of bonds. Secured bonds, this is where the borrower will pledge and we're going to talk more in, more in detail about the specifics of bonds, but just kind of in general, so you know what a bond is now, hopefully. Um, kind of to back up a little bit, you as an individual investor, um, you could buy stock in Apple, which is a little more risky, right? You buy their stock, you hope the price goes up, you sell the stock, you make money. That's how you get return on that. Or you could get a dividend, if Apple pays dividends. From holding their stock, you can get a dividend. There's two ways you can get money if you buy stock. Dividend or share price appreciation. The price of your shares goes up. Or if you're not willing to take on that much risk, um, the stock market goes up and down a lot. So you could buy Apple stock and the price goes down and they don't pay any dividends. And then you're screwed. You've lost money. You could hold on to it until it goes back up, try to make Try to make money, but if you want, if you don't want to take that much risk, what investors often do instead of buying Apple stock, they buy an Apple bond. That's less risky because they're buying essentially this promise, and Apple has does not have an incentive. Well, first of all, it's a promise. Apple has to pay interest every six months at the rate stated on their bond certificate, right? And Apple has to give you back $10,000 at the end of 10 years. And Apple has great incentive to not default on that promise. So companies sometimes do default on their bonds. But if they do that, then their bonds get um, rated much less. So there's a bond rating agencies like Moody's. If you've ever heard of the S&P 500. S&P stands for Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's, one of the things they do as a company is they rate bonds, they rate corporate bonds. And so if your bond as a company gets de, you know, demoted in terms of its rating, then less potential investors or, or lenders are gonna buy your bond or give you money. So you have every incentive to um, not default on your bond. 
So my, my point is, is, as an investor, you can either buy Apple stock or you can buy Apple's bonds. It's much less risky to buy Apple's bonds than it is to buy their stock. Of course, the rate of return you get on the bond usually isn't nearly as good as the rate of return you could get on the stock. But again, it's the classic risk reward trade-off. You take on more risk, buy the stock, you have a potential to get a higher return, higher expected return. Take on less risk, buy the bond, you don't have as high of an expected return. Anyway, um, types of bonds. So these types of bonds kind of relate to the risk of the bond. So a secured bond, this is where the, the borrower or the, the company, they'll, they will pledge specific property as collateral in case they're, they default on the bond and they can't pay you the interest that they promised they would or pay you back the principal amount at the maturity date. So in, they'll they'll have a bond and inside the it'll be in the fine print on this certificate. So there's lots of fine print. These are the these are the things I wrote the things that are on all bonds. And then there's other fine print that's on that are and that depends on the bond. So some bonds are secured bonds, and Apple could in the fine print say, if we fail to pay you interest or the principal back, here is you, you can you can um, give this bond certificate back to us return it to us and we'll in exchange we will give you you know 100 shares of our stock for free you give us a certificate we give you the shares um, they'll pledge some sort of specific property as you can imagine secured bonds from the borrower standpoint are a little more risky right because it's like we default if we default on the bond we don't pay the the lender back we got to give them some property and so um, usually the interest rate on secured bonds, the amount of interest we're going to promise to the lender is not as high, because you know, if we fail to meet that interest, we're going to have to give them specific property. We're less likely to fail to meet the to pay the interest if the rate is um, lower, right? So there's a relation between these types of bonds and then the rate on the interest that they're that they're um, promising. The venture bonds rely on the general credit worthiness of the borrower. So some bonds known as debenture bonds, AKA junk bonds, um, don't have any collateral, collateral at all. So these types of bonds might have a higher stated interest rate on them, but if the borrower defaults, the lender essentially legally is up a creek. There's no something they can do. Of course, the borrower's um, bond rating will go way down. Their credit worthiness will go down. And that's the borrower doesn't have an incentive for that to happen. But hey, if they fall on hard times and it's a debenture bond, they don't have to satisfy it legally. And so as a lender, you're out of luck. You can't collect the amount that's owed to you. Um, most bonds, corporate bonds are secured. Um, if you want to get a highly rated bond by Moody's or Standard & Poor's, if you want those rating agencies to rate your bonds highly, you will offer specific collateral in case you default. If you offer junk bonds, those agencies, those are the primary bond rating agencies, they will rate your bond very low. And all the investors out there, all the potential lenders out there, they can go look and publicly see what your bond rating is. They can literally shop different companies. Apple's corporate bonds are probably very highly rated. And so investors are more likely to buy Apple bonds than they would be to buy some company whose bonds are very low rated. I can almost guarantee you that Apple's bonds are all secured. They don't offer any junk bonds. Series, uh, serial bonds mature over a series of years. Don't worry about that. Convertible bonds grant the, the lender, the, the one who holds the promise from the borrower, they grant the lender the right to convert the bond into the company's common stock at a specific conversion rate. So there's some, if it's a convertible bond, the lender has the formal right, if they want to, like say they buy this, say you buy this, say you're the lender and I'm the borrower, I'm the company. I print up this bond certificate and you buy it from me. So you have this promise for me in your hands. And in my hands, I have the money you gave me, that you lended me, which may be 10,000, maybe a little more than 10,000, maybe a little less than 10,000. We'll talk about that in a second. So say you do that now, 
April 17th, 2020. Five years from now, April 17th, 2025, um, this bond that you have is a convertible bond. It says that on your in the fine print. And so say you decide you want to give me the promise back, give me the bond certificate back, so I no longer have to give you $10,000 um, in 2030. I've been paying you interest for the last five years. I no longer have to continue paying you interest for the next five years. And in exchange for me not having to do that, I now have to give you the some of my stock for free. I have to give it to you at whatever the conversion rate is on that was printed on the on the bond certificate. So that's what a convertible bond is. Convertible bonds are rather attractive to potential investors or lenders because um, they have this. It gives the lender more options. The right, you know, what happens if um you hold a bond from Apple? Say you hold a bond from a company who is very adversely affected by the stock market, by some news in the stock market, but you know that company will rebound. So their stock price is gonna fall drastically. You could convert the bond and you think the stock price is gonna go up a ton in the future because you think that this is just, all this will just blow over, it's just noise. Like what happened, what's happened recently in the stock market due to the virus. So you would convert the bond, right? You would give the bond back to the company. You would get a lot, a lot of shares of stock. And then when that price of that stock rose, you would get the stock for free, right? And when that stock rose, if it rose as you expected, you'd be able to sell it and make a ton of money. A lot more than you could have made just by holding the bond and keep getting the interest. And then the, and then the principal repaid to you at the end of the maturity, maturity term. So that's why convertible bonds could be potentially attractive in certain situations to investors. Uh, whoops. Zero coupon bonds means zero means the coupon rate is zero or the stated rate or this rate right here is zero. They pay no interest periodically, but they are issued at a large discount. And we're going to talk about that in a second. What is what's the issue price of the bond? So far we've talked about this promise that the borrower the face value is the amount the borrower promises to give the lender at the maturity date. But in exchange for that promise, what does the lender lend the borrower? Do they lend them the face value? Not necessarily. You can read about these different um, provisions. Those aren't so important. We've already told this, talked about terminology. All right. The market rate of interest. And so if we go back to our example with the bond certificate, the stated rate of interest is the rate of interest on the bond certificate. Right here, 8%. It's what the borrower promises to give the lender every time they pay them interest, in this case, every six months. That's the stated interest rate. We have to contrast that interest rate with the market interest rate. The market interest rate is what is used by the lender to decide how much do they lend the borrower for this, for receiving this promise, this bond certificate. And that's the only thing we use the market rate for is how much, well, that's one, that's the main thing we use it for as a lender or from the borrower's perspective, how much they're going to receive from the lender. That's gonna depend on the market interest rate. I mean, it depends some on the stated rate, but more, it more depends on how the market rate relates to the stated interest rate. So keep in mind, you're the lender, you see this bond certificate of mine advertised, and you want to buy this from me or lend me money on April 17th, 2020, today. This certificate was printed January 1st, 2018. As of January 1st, 2018, the market rate for a bond with these features, $10,000 face value, 10 year maturity, and an 8%, I'm sorry, 10 year maturity, and paying interest semi annually, a bond at, that, at this date with these features had a market rate of 8%. That's what the bonds were paying in the market. And so when we printed this bond certificate, we put 
as our stated rate. That was the market rate on January 1st, 2018. But now, today, on April 17th, 2020, you know, two years and four months and 17 days, days later, the market rate for a bond with these features, $10,000 face value, 10-year maturity, paying interest once every six months, semi-annually, the market rate now has changed to 10%. Bonds with these features are now paying 10% on April 17th, 2020. So there's a difference between the market rate and the stated rate on the date we're deciding to invest. Because, because companies don't print bonds every day, they print them you know, periodically, it gives rise to this potential thing happening, right? Where the date that the person is deciding to buy the bond might be way later than the date the bond was printed, and therefore the market interest rate may have changed from the stated interest rate to a new number. And so, I mean, 8% used to be the market rate on the date that it was printed, but now the market rate's this. And so the idea here is you can reason from the borrower's perspective. Um, in this case, you probably want to reason from the lender's perspective, though. So a lender says, a potential lender sees this bond, this bond right here, and says, hmm, this bond with these, these characteristics, $10,000 face value, I'm going to get $10,000 in 10 years from now. I'm going to get interest once every six months. Bonds with these characteristics, other companies right now are offering 10%. So if I'm going to invest in this bond, which is offering 8% interest, less interest, then I am definitely not going to give the company the face value. I'm going to give them less than face value. And so bonds where the market interest rate is greater than the stated interest rate, are issued at a discount. The issue price of the bond is the amount that the lender gives the borrower. It's the amount that the borrower receives from the lender. In this case, when the market rate is 10% and the borrower is offering 8%, the borrower would receive an amount less than $10,000. The issue price would be less than the face value. How much less? We'll talk about that in a second, how to calculate the issue price. If we reverse the situation, what happens if the market rate today, April 17th, 2020, is 6%? So now we're two years, four months, and 17 days after this bond was printed. At that time, the market was 8%. Now the market rate for a, similar, for a bond of, with these characteristics is paying 6% interest. Now reason from the borrower's perspective. A lender approaches me and wants to give me $10,000 for this promise, for this bond. I'm gonna tell them, wait, other companies are offering $10,000 face value bonds with the same characteristics as my bond, but they're only paying 6% interest. You gotta give me more than 10,000 for my promise. Because I'm giving, I'm going to give you 8% interest, and they're only going to give you 6% interest. If you'd give them $10,000 for their promise and get less interest, you got to give me more than $10,000 for my promise, because you're going to get more interest. And so bonds for where the stated rate is greater than the market rate, they're always issued at a premium. The amount the borrower gets from the lender is more than the face value. In this case, I, the borrower will require the lender to give me more than 10,000. Hopefully that makes sense. You can go back, that's the part of this that students have the most trouble understanding. Why is it that when the market rate is less than the stated rate, 6% less than 8%, why is it that the issue price is greater than the face value? The bonds are issued at a premium. And what's the logic for when the market rate is greater than the stated rate, 10%, greater than 8%, the bonds are always issued at a discount. Issue price is less than the face value. Why? And I just gave you why. It has to do with the fact, the main reason, the underlying reason why is because time has passed. Now we're April 17th, 2020. The bond certificate was printed two years ago, two years, four months, and 17 days ago. 
January 1st, 2018. So because time has passed, at that time the rate was 8%. Now the market rate is different. Because the market rate is different, that's why the issue price won't be equal to the face value. If today happened to be January 1st, 2018, then the market rate would equal 8%. It would equal the stated rate. And in that case, the lender would receive, the borrower would receive $10,000 from the lender. Issue price and the face value would be the same. All right, so let's, I've kind of summarized lots of PowerPoints already. I've already summarized this. All right, what are the journal entries? When a bond is issued at face value, that means the borrower receives the face value from the lender. Issue price equals face value. Or another way to say it is the market rate and the stated rate are equal to each other. So issuance at face value means issue price equals face value or aka um, market rate equals stated rate. The market interest rate equals the rate that's printed on the bond certificate, stated interest rate. What's the journal entry from the borrower standpoint? Not the lender, the borrower. Everything in this chapter, chapter 10, liabilities, all from the borrower standpoint. Say it's a $1,000 face value bond. The borrower would debit cash for $1,000. They would receive $1,000. They would receive the face value. The issue price is what the borrower receives. That equals the face value. Debit cash 1,000, credit bond payable 1,000. Got a credit bond payable for always for the face value. Because that's what our promise is, whatever the certificate says. What if we issued the bonds at a discount? In other words, the issue price was less than the face value. Or another way to say that is the, um, the market rate of interest greater than the stated rate. Stated rate's 8%, market rate's 10%. Bonds are going to be issued at a dis discount. Borrower will receive less than face value. Then debit cash, the borrower is going to debit cash for what they receive, 970. Credit bond payable for the face value. Always credit bond payable. That's the promise. We promise to pay $1,000 10 years from now or whatever this the term is on this bond. And then you debit in, we have to have another debit. And we debit an account called discount on bonds payable. Discount on bonds payable is a contra account to bonds payable. So it reduces the balance in the bond payable account. Just like accumulated depreciation dash equipment reduces the balance in the equipment account. Book value of the equipment is the equipment balance minus the accumulated depreciation equipment balance. Same thing with bonds payable. The, um, the net bond payable on the balance sheet, when you look at the long-term liability section, it's going to be the balance in bonds payable minus less whatever the balance in the discount on bond payable account is. What if we issue the bond at a premium? Then to record the issuance, um, this is where the market rate is less than the stated rate. The issue price is greater than the face value. We're going to receive, the borrower is going to receive more than what we promised to give them back. We receive more initially, right? But we always give them back more than what we receive. Because we receive an amount once, 1050 we promised to pay them a thousand back ten years from now, but we're also going to give them interest every six months. And if you add up all that plus the amount we give them back, that's always going to be more than what we receive. So everything makes sense logically here. It's just initially we're going to issue it at a premium because the market and stated rates, um, the market rate is less than the stated rate. So in that case, we debit cash for what we receive, as always, credit bond payable for what we promised to pay back, what we owe, and we we need another credit. 
So we credit an account called premium on bonds payable. Premium on bonds payable is an adjunct account to bonds payable. So premium on bonds payable has the same balance as bonds payable. It, it, it increases the balance on bonds payable. It increases the net bond payable. If we were to report bond payable on the balance sheet after this journal entry, bond payable would have a balance of 1,000 plus the balance in premium on bonds payable of 50 equals the net bond payable 1,050. Our net liability 1,050 as of this date whenever this happened. So an account that, I think we've talked about adjunct accounts already in this course. I know we've talked about contra accounts. Accumulated depreciation dash equipment is a contra account to equipment. So that was an example. And then sales um, discounts is a contra account to sales revenue. Sales returns and allowances is a contra account to um, sales revenue as well. Now, I thought we had talked about adjunct accounts. An adjunct account is the opposite of a contra account. It's an account that's linked to the main account, but it increases that account, not decreases. Positively related, not negatively related. So bonds maturing in over a year appear on the balance sheet as a long-term liability just because of the definition, short-term versus current versus long-term, it has to do with this one-year thing. Got to get rid of this. I have a hair on my screen, which you can't see. If there's a balance in discount on bonds payable, it appears as a reduction of the liability. And if there's a balance in premium on bonds payable, it appears an addition of the liability. So in the case, in the former case that we looked at before, this would be the balance sheet presentation of the discount and this would be the balance sheet presentation of the premium. What are advantage, what are, now let's talk about some qualitative things. If you're a corporation and you're wanting to raise money, essentially you have two ways, two ways to raise a large amount of money. You can either do it through equity financing or you can do it through debt financing. Debt financing is primarily achieved through bonds. So you can think of bond financing or debt financing as equivalent. What are some advantages of using, going the debt financing route? Well, you don't have to give up ownership in your company. You don't have to give them shares. So there's no ownership interest dilution. Since bondholders are, are creditors, they're lenders, they're not owners. They're separate from the company. They're like a bank. They're just a bunch of individual banks because individuals are the ones that buy the bonds. And sometimes banks buy the bonds as well um, or other companies buy the bonds. But there's no in ownership interest dilution. You're not giving up, um, you're not giving any shares away. You're just giving a promise to these people that you're going to repay them. Bond interest expense is tax deductible. In contrast, if you do equity financing and you give them shares and you pay a dividend to all your shareholders who, have, who hold shares, that dividend you pay is not tax deductible. You can't deduct that for tax reasons. So often um, companies will go the debt financing route because it's interest expense. It's tax deductible. Less dollar, less court, less of their corporate dollars are going to the federal government or to the state government. Less of the dollars are going to Uncle Sam. More dollars are staying within the company. Just pure interest effect. Or I'm sorry, a pure tax effect. Taxes have a large effect at the corporate level. Um, leverage. So those shareholders who those those people who do have shares in the company, um, the share price could go up more. So the price per share on the on the, say you hold Apple's shares of stock, 
and the price per share of Apple could go up more or faster. Um, if the firm can take these borrowed funds, funds gotten through borrowing, through debt financing, from issuing bonds, if they can take those funds, if they can use those borrowed funds and earn a rate of return on those funds, that money that they've gotten from those lenders, if they can take that money and invest it in profitable projects and get a rate of return higher than, than the interest expense on those bonds, than the interest rate that they've promised to pay in those bonds, that's the cost of the funds, right? The interest, the interest rate. Then um, the not only are they not they're not increasing ownership in the company, so they're not dilute, diluting their ownership ownership interest. They're um, the current owners. Um, the price per share for the for the people who who hold shares who are current owners could go up faster or go up more um, based on if the company can use these borrowed funds can earn a rate of return on the using the borrowed funds higher than the cost of using those funds essentially it's just known as leverage if they issue more shares of stock and get money from new shareholders that's equity financing they dilute the ownership um, the current shareholders the new shareholders and the, the old shareholders all the shareholders the company's not required to ever pay them any money. They're, what the shareholders hope the company does is take the money that they've just given the company and use that money to invest in profitable projects so that their price of their, their value of their shares goes up, stock price goes up. But at least in with the borrowing, if the company borrows the money, they have to pay interest. So there is a cost of borrowing and they therefore have to have a higher incentive to invest the money that was lended to them in profitable projects that earn a rate of return at least higher than the cost of borrowing, so that otherwise they're losing money for sure as a company. So there's more of an incentive to take money that they've gotten and invest it in profitable projects. And that will, if they do that, that will increase the share price for shareholders. So that, that's the idea. Debt financing gives more of an incentive. Equity financing the company gets the money from the shareholders, but there's no, they don't ever have to pay that back formally or legally, they are not required, they don't have to give a dividend. Companies don't have to give dividends. They decide voluntarily to. So they never have to actually give money back to the shareholders. So there's not as much of an incentive. Of course, there is an implied incentive if they don't do it, if they just squander the money and then current shareholders are gonna wanna sell their stock, price, stock prices are gonna go down, you know, eventually the company will go bankrupt. There is an incentive, it's just not as formal of an incentive. So leverage is this idea of, of the total financing the company obtains, what's the relative ratio debt to equity? So that's leverage, it's debt financing divided by equity financing, essentially. Disadvantages of financing through bonds. Well, interest on the bonds legally has to be paid. It's a contractual obligation. If the company defaults and they can't pay interest, things happen. Legal things, you know, bondholders, lenders can sue. The company could be held liable in a court of law and have to pay all sorts of things. So that's unlike dividends. If the company gets the money through equity financing, they don't have to pay a dividend. They do, if they get the money through debt financing, they have to pay those debt holders, those bondholders. Um, there's also a repayment date. They have to pay by a specific date. There's more pressure. Borrowing agreements can restrict company actions. Um, these are called debt covenants. So because the company is issuing all these bonds, we got all these various lenders that are lending the company money in exchange for all these promises the company has promised. There are certain covenants the company has to abide by um, keep certain ratios at certain levels and they can't fall below a certain minimum level um, if or else the SEC slaps them on the hand and fines them and stuff like that and so it can restrict the company's actions because they're trying to only do actions that don't don't violate these debt covenants all right 
Jones Company issued a $1,000 face amount 20-year bond and received $950 at the time of issuance. So the issued price is $950. Face value, $1,000. Jones Company is the borrower. They got $950. It doesn't ask for the journal entry, but they would debit cash for $950. Credit, bond, payable for $1,000. That's what they promised to repay. When will they pay the $1,000 back to the lender? 20 years from now. We need another debit. Discount on bond payable, 50 bucks. Bond sold at a discount. When issue price is less than face value, bond sold at discount. Um, in this case, the market rate must be greater than or less than the stated rate. So let this be market rate. Let this be stated rate. What's the relationship between them if bonds are issued at a discount? You could pause the video to answer. Bonds issued at a discount. This must hold. The rate stated on the bond certificate must be less than the market rate. And I went through the logic of why about 10 to 15 minutes ago in the video. All right, another objective in this chapter, contingent liabilities. What are contingent liabilities? These are defined as obligations, current obligations that result from past events. Some of these things also require a future event to happen before they are, are, are a um, complete obligation. So whether the company makes a journal entry for the thing and calls it a liability depends, so recording, depends on the likelihood of the future event and the ability to measure the obligation. So for example, say you're Starbucks and as of the end of the fiscal year, you're about to do your financial statements, and you you have a class action lawsuit filed against you by a group of your former employees citing wage discrimination. They say that um, some employees in your San Francisco and in, in a couple of your San Francisco Starbucks locations report being paid 15 bucks an hour, and employees in your Detroit, Michigan a couple of your Detroit, Michigan locations who do the exact same job responsibilities as the people in San Francisco, they do the same thing. They report being paid $8 an hour. And so they come together and they, well, the people who are being paid less come together and um, say, hey, you're paying me half of what you're paying someone else to do the same thing, wage discrimination. So they all come together, they file a class action lawsuit against Starbucks, say they do that on December 1st, and December 31st is the end of the accounting period. The lawsuit is pending. What does Starbucks do? It depends. We'll talk about it in a second. That's an example of a contingent liability. Environmental cleanup costs, you can imagine that. Credit guarantees. All right. So you record the liability on the balance sheet. So you make a formal journal entry for the, for the liability. If both of these things happen, If the likelihood of the future event is probable, so in this case for Starbucks, the future event would be that they would <clears throat> they would be ordered by the courts to pay this group of people some money. That is probable. So they'd have an obligation to pay these people money. And if a reasonable estimate of the obligation amount can be made. So that not only do we have to um, determine that it's probable we're going to have to pay something, but we also have to be able to reasonably estimate how much we'd have to pay. Both of those things. Then we record it. We make a journal entry. Don't really don't worry about what the journal entry is for the exam. Just know that just know what conditions need to happen before we make a journal entry or if we don't make a journal entry. 
we do need to disclose it in the notes to our financial statements. So we need to make, talk about it in a paragraph, but we don't have to record it in a journal entry and therefore it doesn't show up on the balance sheet. If the likelihood of the future event is reasonably, reasonably possible, but not probable, or if we cannot make an estimate of the amount. So if, if either one of these things isn't true, then we just need to disclose it in the notes. And again, you might wonder, well, what's the difference between reasonably possible and probable? Don't worry about that distinction. That distinction won't determine an answer on the exam, so you won't have to worry about that. But that is a, a valid point. The wording in the accounting rules is a little ambiguous. They try to stay away from number ranges and just use words like more, like, more likely than not, or phrases like more likely than not, reasonably possible, probable. But um, we might not, we, not, we might not be able to determine what's the difference between reasonably possible and probable, but I think we could all agree that there is a difference. Probable seems more likely than reasonably possible. If probable is 80%, reasonably possible seems should be less than 80%. So wherever we define probable, wherever we put that on a scale of zero to one, we gotta put reasonably possible less than that. It seems, that to me, that seems true. If the likelihood of the future event is remote, and the assumption is if the likelihood of the future event is remote, well, even if we can make a reasonable estimate of the obligation, if, if we were to have to incur it, if the, if the obligation, the chance of it happening is remote, then um, we just ignore it and that doesn't even show up. And so what Starbucks did, and this is an actual example I gave, is I read about this pending lawsuit in the notes to their financial statements. So that means that one of these things was true, but not both of these things. In other words, one of these things was not true. So either the likelihood of the future event, the fact that it showed up in the notes means that the likelihood of the future event was reasonably possible, but not probable, but not remote though, because if it was remote, then we'd ignore it. So either the likelihood of the future event was the likelihood of them having to pay this group of people a bunch of money, be ordered to pay them a bunch of money by the courts, was um, reasonably possible. They determined it wasn't probable. Um, or the an estimate of the obligation amount couldn't be made, a reasonable estimate. It was probably this one. They could probably have made an estimate of the, what they would have to pay. But just given their history of lawsuits a lot of lawsuits have been filed against all these big companies so they probably can make this estimate but the likelihood of the thing of them having to pay anything must have just been only reasonably possible and that's why i saw it in the notes and i didn't see it on the financial statements themselves and then the final thing in this chapter would be these ratios so several ratios that we can use to analyze how companies are doing with their liabilities, satisfying their liabilities. Current ratio, quick ratio, times interest earned ratio. Three, three ratios. So current assets minus current liabilities is known as working capital. In general, as you can imagine, the bigger this difference is, the higher the working capital, its company is viewed as more preferable. They have a stronger financial position. Two measures of working capital ad adequacy are the current ratio and the quick ratio. The current ratio is the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. So what, what percentage of current assets do current liabilities equal? So you would hope that this current ratio is bigger than one. Or bigger than or equal to one. If the current ratio is less than one, 
that means the liabilities are bigger than the assets. The current liabilities are bigger than the current assets. That means they don't even have enough current assets to satisfy their current obligations. That's terrible. Definitely don't invest in a company where the current ratio is less than one. Don't buy their stock, don't buy their bonds. Historically, a current ratio below two is considered a potential concern. Definitely below one's a concern. Um, but even in the past, below two is considered a concern. However, more recently, many companies have successfully maintained um, much lower current ratios, somewhere between one and two. The quick ratio is a more conservative estimate or subset of the company's working capital adequacy. Some current assets are difficult to convert to cash. So you would think, well, all the current assets, we can just immediately get that into cash and use that cash and satisfy our current liabilities. But some current assets are hard to convert to cash. Only the more liquid current assets are included in the quick ratio. So the denominator of the quick ratio is the same as the current ratio, but the numerator is only those most, most liquid current assets. Cash, short-term investments. Short-term investments are things like, say we bought some of another company's stock and we intend to hold it for 30 days and then sell it. We can quickly convert that stock to cash, right? Just sell it on the open market very easily. It could be some land that we bought or it could be real estate that we intend to turn around within a year, again, short-term. And then, Counts receivable. That's pretty quickly turned into cash. But other as other current assets like inventory, that could be harder to turn into cash. We have to sell the stuff, and then we have to we usually sell on account, and then we have to go collect those accounts receivable from customers. That's two steps removed from cash. Things of that nature are not included in the quick ratio. So the quick ratio, the the numerator, is smaller than the numerator of the current ratio. So the quick ratio by definition has to be smaller than the current ratio because the denominator is the same. The denominators of the two ratios are the same. But the numerator of the quick ratio is smaller. So the ratio is gonna be smaller. It's a more conservative estimate. And then finally, the times interest earned ratio. It provides an indication of a company's ability to make interest payments to its lenders. We just take the income before any interest expense or income taxes. So all the revenue minus all the expenses, except don't minus two expenses, don't minus interest expense, don't minus income taxes. And then divide that by interest expense. It's the income that we have to contribute to covering an interest expense. So of course we want this times interest earned ratio to be as big as possible. Definitely bigger than one. Hopefully five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Because this interest expense, again, these are expenses we're talking about. So they're for the current year, what's our interest expense? What do we what are we gonna at least have to owe in the future for interest? Um that's what that's what we owe. Based on this year, we might not have to pay it this year, but we have to pay it either this year or next year. And, and then this is what we have to, to pay our interest. So we want that, we want to have plenty, you know, plenty of money to pay our interest. Because why? Because we have to pay interest. It's a contractual obligation, right? Interest on bonds is usually the biggest part of interest expense. There's also interest on notes, which is usually a smaller part. But this is a big amount that's contractually, we're contractually obligated to pay, legally obligated. And so we better have um, plenty of money to pay that. So that's coming up, it's coming due. So many investment professionals believe the ratio should be at least, um, this is misspelled, at least in the three to four range. All right, Norton Company reports the following for the current year, cash 300, Short-term investments, 500. Accounts receivable, 1,000. Inventory, 700. Total current assets, 2,500. Total current liabilities, 1,000. What's the current ratio? What's the quick ratio? Current ratio, current assets, divided by current liabilities, 
2.5. So we know it's either B, C, or D. A is off the question. A is out. So 2.5 to 1 is the current ratio if you want to view it like that. And then the quick ratio is just the um, most liquid assets, cash, plus short-term investments, plus accounts receivable, divided by current liabilities. So 1,800 divided by 1,000, 1 1.8 to 1. So it looks like B's right. All right, Appendix 10A. Chapter 10 has two appendices, A and B. You need to know A, but you don't need to know all of A. What do you need to know from A? You need to know the straight line method for amortizing the bond discount or premium. You do not need to know the effective interest method. And we're going to talk about what amortizing the bond discount or premium is here right now. Bond pricing or the issue price. We've talked about this already. How do we find the issue price? All right. On the what do you have to know? You do not have to know how to find the issue price. You're going to you're going to be given the issue price on the exam. How would you find the issue price? The issue price, you have to use time value of money concepts. Some, so some finance concepts, some present value concepts. Issue price is equal to the sum of two things. It's the present value of the face value. You're going to, if you're the borrower, you're going to receive, I'm sorry, if you're the lender, you're going to, you, you calculate the issue price from the lender's perspective because they're the ones giving the money to the borrower. Whoever's giving up the money is the one you calculate how much is going to be given. So think from the lender's perspective. What are they going to receive at the maturity date? Like we're at time T now. Say the maturity term of the bond is 10 years. We're standing here right now trying to decide how much I'm going to give this borrower. They're promising to give me the face value of the bond is $10,000, but I'm not gonna get that 10,000 until 10 years from now, over here. But we're right here trying to find the issue price. How much am I gonna lend the borrower for a promise that I'm gonna get 10,000 10 years from now? So what I wanna do is find what's the present value of this 10,000? What's the value right now of that 10,000 that I would receive 10 years from now? That's the present value, but also I'm going to get interest every six months. It could be every quarter of a year. It could be every month. Usually, though, bonds pay semi-annual interest. So every six months, I'm going to be getting interest. So from, from the standpoint of right now, I know six months from now, I'm going to get an amount. A year from now, I'm going to get another amount, the same amount. A year and a half from now, I'm going to get the same amount again. In other words, I'm going to get an annuity. I'm going to get a, an annuity is a steady stream, fixed equal payments. So what I need to do is calculate what's the value to me now of this steady stream of payments? What's the present value of the interest payments? If you add up the present value of the interest payments and the present value of the face value, that gives the lender the amount that they're going to give the borrower, that they're going to lend the borrower. That's the amount the borrower is going to receive from the lender, aka the issue price. It's calculated as the sum of the present value of the face value and the present value of the interest payments. How do you find that? There's formulas you can use, and I could show you the formulas. And I do show the formulas in whenever I teach cost accounting, accounting 305. You'll also learn, learn it in uh, accounting 311. But in this course, you're not responsible for knowing those formulas. Another way you can get it, instead of using formulas, you can use time value of money tables. And I'm not going to teach that either. So Appendix 10A does teach that. It teaches it using a table, time value of money tables. They don't actually give you the formulas. 
um, but you're not responsible for calculating the issue price. I'll just give you the issue price. I'll give you the actual, I'll give you this. But just in general, this is how you would get the issue price. All right, getting close to being done here. I know we've been going for a while. Oops, what did I do? I don't know what I did. Messed up. I messed something up. Oh, here we go. Let me erase this uh, stuff. So as I said, um, you add the present value of these two things together. And of course, the issue price and the face value will often differ. They will often differ um, because the stated interest rate and the market interest rate differ. So bonds are either going to sell at a premium or a discount. This premium or discount has to be amortized. Amortized means reduced. One way you can reduce this premium or discount is you can use the effective interest method. To use the effective interest method, you would need to use a table like this. You're not responsible for this. Don't look at these slides. Don't even think about this. It will just be extra technical details you have to remember for exam three. They won't be on exam three. So that's in appendix 10A. You are responsible for knowing how to amortize the premium or discount, though, using the straight line method. There's two methods you can use, straight line or effective interest method, and you're responsible for the straight line method. What is the straight line method? I'm trying to uh, find an example, and then it goes to Appendix 10B, fine. Let, I will back up and show you the example of the straight line method with one of those first bond, bond examples we were looking at in the beginning of these PowerPoints. I'm gonna do that in a second. Appendix 10B, what are you responsible for? You're responsible for Appendix 10B leases. All right, you're responsible for the terminology. You're responsible for knowing the criteria of whether a lease should be classified as a financing lease or an operating lease. And those are the only two things you're responsible for. So all qualitative things, no, no calculating anything with leases. So in Appendix 10B, it's really short appendix. You're just responsible for the, quanti the qualitative part of it. So a lease is where a company Instead of purchasing purchasing an asset and owning it, they rent the asset or they lease it for a specified period of time. The owner of the property is called the lessor. The person who uses the property is called the lessee. The person who leases the property and uses it is the lessee. The rights to use the property are called a leasehold. Types of leases, two types. The way you account for them depends on what type you classified it as. And there has been a lot of discussion amongst the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, the, one, the ones who make GAAP. There's been a lot of discussion in the last few years about they've redone parts of GAAP in, re, in regard to leases, how you should account for leases. So whether the lease is a financing lease or an operating lease, that doesn't matter in, in, in the sense that both of those, whether you classify it as finance or operating, the lessee, the person who's using the property, usually the company, they've leased the building and they're using the building, they're occupying it. The lessee has to record the leased asset and its corresponding lease liability on the balance sheet at an amount equal to the present value of the future lease payments. Um, that's all you need to know in regards to that. It's just one journal entry, you debit leased asset, leased building, credit leased liability. And for what amount? The present value of the future lease payments, which you're not responsible for calculating that. You essentially take what you have to pay, you know, each year. Say you're gonna, leases are in, in a term, it's a lease term. You're gonna lease for 10 years, Say we're at the beginning, 
we're going to have to make 10 annual lease payments of $200,000 $200, each year at the end of each year. What's the present value of that stream of $200,000, 10 $200,000 payments into the future? What's the present value of that? And that's the amount that you record for the debit and the credit. Debit account would be leased building, debit credit account would be leased, leased, leased liability, leased liability related to building. All right, whether it's finance or operating lease, that's the journal entry. So the same balance sheet, whether it's a financing lease or an operating lease, that doesn't matter in terms of the balance sheet presentation. You're gonna debit lease as a credit lease liability. But in terms of the income statement presentation, it definitely matters. So a lease is considered a financing lease if at least one of the following criteria is met. So only one of these has to be met. If two are met or three or four or five, that's great, but only one needs to be met. If one is met or more, then it's a financing lease. If none of, if none of them are met, it's an operating lease. As you can imagine, if a lease is classified as an operating lease, you're going to have to recognize more expense and it's gonna show up on the income statement. If the lease is classified as a financing lease, you're not gonna to have to recognize as much expense. And so your income statement's gonna look better. Your net income's gonna be higher. But as far as the um, actual effects on the income statement, like what's the journal entry, you don't have to know that. All right. Five criteria. If the lease transfers ownership of the property to the lessee at the end of the lease term. So the lessee, the company, you have leased the building for 10 years from the lessor, whoever owns the building. At the end of 10 years, if the lease agreement in it says that at the end of 10 years, you get the building, it becomes yours. All you have to do is pay me this lease payment of $200,000 every year for 10 years, and then at the end of 10 years, it becomes yours, then it's a financing lease. Or if the lease contains a bargain purchase price, this means that in the lease agreement, if it says at the end of 10 years, you can, the building doesn't become yours right away, but you can purchase the building for a much reduced price. You can purchase the building for $200,000. Say the, you've been paying 200000 each of the 10 years. You, you, so over 10 years, you paid um, $2 million. And at the end of it, there's this agreement in the lease, but you have to know this up front, day one. It says you could purchase the building for you know a, a bargain, for a bargain, essentially. There's a bargain purchase option. Then it's a financing lease. Or if the lease term, 10 years, say, is a major part of the remaining economic life of the leased asset. So here you have to decide what's the economic life of the leased asset. And then also, whenever you start leasing the asset, say the life of an say the life of that building is 30 years, you start leasing it um, in year 20, and you and you lease it year 20 through year 30. So the lease term is 10 years. And from the, from the time point that you started leasing it, year 20, what's the remaining economic life? 10 years. So the lease term, 10 years, wouldn't you say 10 years is a major part of 10 years, the remaining? Yeah, it's 100% of it. So then that would be a financing lease. However, what if you start leasing it year one and the lease term is 10 years? In year one though, what's the remaining economic life? 30. So the lease term, 10 years divided by 30, remaining economic life from the time when you started leasing it. I would say that 10 divided by 30, 10 is not a major part of 30. It's one third of 30. So here again, we get major. What's major mean? Don't worry about that. That won't come up on the exam, the distinction between is major 30% or 50%. Just know that, just know in general, the qualitative uh, criteria. Or if the present value of the lease payments and any residual value guarantees is equal to or more than substantially all the leased assets fair value. 
Don't even worry about trying to understand that statement. Just memorize the statement. I don't even want to get into it. But I could, but there's no need to. Or if the leased asset has no alternate use to the lessor at the end of the lease term. So you've leased this asset at the end of the lease term. The person who actually owns the asset, the lessor, they don't have any use for it. If that happens, then you can the lessee can call it a financing lease. Even if it's even if ownership still remains with the lessor, but it's not transferred to you, the lessee. Even if that happens, if the lessor has no use for it, then lessee gets to call it a financing lease. Now, if any of these five, if if none of these five are met, then the lease is an operating lease. Okay, there was one final thing I said I would do. Let's go back. I wanted to show you how to account for amortizing the bond discount or premium, but not using the effective interest method, using the straight line method. That's super easy. Let's go back to the very beginning when we first saw the discount. Oops. Actually, let me, uh, let me go back to Here. Actually, you know what? Let me create my own example. That will be more helpful, I believe. So let's go here. Let's say face value of a bond. $10,000. And let's say the issue price equals um, $9,400. So the bond was issued at a discount. So as a borrower, you debited cash $9,400 when you issued the bond. So you gave the bond certificate to the lender, and in return, the lender gave you $9,400. You credited bond payable for 10,000, and you debited this account called discount on bond payable, 600. So this is the journal entry made at um, date of bond issuance. And let's say that date is uh, January 1st, 2020. Let's say the term of the bond is 10 years. So on January 1st, 2030, you have to pay back the lender $10,000. Also, interest is payable semi-annually. So you have to pay the borrower interest once every six months. And the rate, so this is the stated rate of interest. Let's say the stated rate of interest is um, 8%. And because this bond was issued at a discount, that means the market rate of interest must be greater than the stated rate of interest. And let's say the market interest rates so their stated rate is 8% and the market rate of interest is 10%. I might have said 10% up here, sorry. Stated rate's eight, market rate's 10. Initially, we have a discount on bond payable. The, the balance in that account is 600. So we have our bond payable account. The balance, it's a liability, so it has a normal credit balance, 10,000 as of 1, 1, 20. Then we have this contour account to bonds payable, discount on bond payable. And it's sitting there with the beginning balance, debit balance, because it's a contra account to this account. So it has an opposite balance of $600, dollars one, one twenty. All right. How many interest payments will be made by us, the borrower, to the lender? 20. The bond has a term of 10 years, and interest is paid twice a year. 20 interest payments. We're going to make a payment on June 
1st, 2020. That's our first payment. We're going to make a payment on uh, January 1st. Well, let's just say 1231, 2020. We're going to make a payment June 1st, 2021. So every June 1st and every December 31st of a given year, we're going to make an interest payment. For 10 years, we're going to do that. And then on uh, January 1st, 2030, we're going to pay the $10,000 back. All right? So what has to happen every time we make an interest payment, we have to reduce the balance in discount the, in the discount on bond payable account. The bond payable account, that balance, that just stays the same for the next 10 years. We only reduce that whenever we pay the 10,000 back. But this discount on bond payable account, we have to amortize that balance over time. Amortize, which means reduce. Every time we pay interest, we have to reduce a portion of this balance, which means we have to make a credit entry to this account. And the question is, how much are we going to make the credit entry for on June 1st, 2020, which is the first time we have to pay interest? How much are we going to make the credit entry? How much are we going to reduce the account? How much are we going to amortize the account? on December 31st, 2020, and so forth. We're gonna reduce it 20 times because we're gonna pay interest 20 times. Every time we pay interest, we have to reduce the balance. The question is, by how much? It depends on what method of amortization you use. In Appendix 10A, they teach two methods. You can either use the effective interest method, method one, so two methods, to amortize effective interest method or straight line method. You don't, you're not responsible for the effective interest method. It's something you'll get into in 312, accounting 312 if you're an accounting major and you go on and take that. You are responsible for the straight line method. <clears throat> the straight line method, as you can imagine, reduces the discount on bond payable account by the same amount. So these amounts will be the same. The effective interest method reduces the discount on bond payable account by a different amount, by a, a decreasing amount. So this amount will be bigger than this amount, will be bigger than this amount, will be bigger than this amount. But at the very end, the balance in the account will be zero. So you will reduce it by $600. The straight line method does it by the same amount. So the amount we reduce by uh, equals, so straight line method, the amount we reduce, reduce the account by or the amount we amortize by is just equal to the original balance divided by the number of interest payments. So in this case, $600 was the original discount divided by 20 interest payments. 10 years, interest paid twice a year. So each time we we're gonna reduce the discount on bond payable account by um, 30 bucks. 20 reductions of $30, and this account, if we put 30 over here, 30 over here, 30, 20 times, this account will have a zero balance at the at the maturity date of 1 1 20, 30, 10 years from now. And so the journal entry then, every time we pay interest, that's the final thing, and then we're done. The journal entry, um, every time we pay interest. <clears throat> Let's take June 1st. 2020, our first interest payment, we're going to debit interest expense um, 
we're going to credit cash and we're going to credit discount on bonds payable. We're going to credit discount on bonds payable for $30, just like I said up here. We're going to reduce it by 30 each time. We're going to credit cash for now. What do we credit cash for? Cash is the interest that we said we would pay based on the stated rate. It's based on this rate. So it's 8% is the annual rate times $10,000. That'd be the annual interest. But interest is paid once every six months. So this is the 12 month rate. We need to get the six month rate. So essentially it's 8% times 10,000 times six over 12. So let's do this 10,000 times 8% times six over 12. This is the amount of cash interest we have to pay every six months. So it's 4% times 10,000, $400. And our interest expense is $430 then. This journal entry we make 20 times, every June 1st, every December 31st. Same journal entry, same dollar amounts. <clears throat> Under the effective interest method, this wouldn't change. That always would be 400. This would be changing, and this would be changing every time we did it. But you're not responsible for the effective interest method. Um, if we wanted to do the balance sheet presentation, suppose we made a balance sheet on, just, on June 1st, 2020. Just suppose we did. Um, in terms of the, this bond, what was the balance sheet presentation? We would have bond payable. The balance is $10,000, right? The balance in bond payable, 10,000. The balance in discounted bond payable, keep in mind we put a $30 right here. So as of June 1st, the balance is $570. So we need to subtract that less. The balance um, in discount on bond payable of $570. And so our net lab, our net obligation as of June 1st, 2020, is $9,430 related to this bond. And as you can see, every time as we march through time, as of um, as of 1231, um, 2029. What will the balance in the discount on bond payable account be? It'll be zero. We will have reduced it all the way from 600 to zero. So this will be zero. And so what will our bond payable be? 10,000. And what is our liability on 12-31-2029 or 1-1-2030? Same day, essentially. Our liability is 10,000. That's what we owe. So everything works out. So hopefully you understand this, understood this lecture. I made it as succinct as I possibly could while still putting all the information in it. And as a result, it's a two hour lecture, so I apologize for that. But um, you can pause it, replay it at your own, at your own wish. And um, apologize for the length, but it is what it is. That's the material that, we, that you need to know. And next time I upload one, it'll be, I'll, I'll be working some practice problems from these concepts.